Hi everyone, welcome. I'm Diana Martin. I am the Director of Communications and Marketing at Rodale Institute and today I am joined by one of our Rodale Institute ambassadors, regenerative farmer and author Acadia Tucker. Thank you so much for being with us Acadia. Thank you for so, having me. Yeah, the session we're doing today is on starting a summer garden. So I have to say um, one thing that's been really interesting this year is the incredible attention on gardening um, in no small part due to the coronavirus pandemic. So we've seen this spring that there's been a real shift in people focusing on both their health and where their food is coming from. Some ways that we're seeing that are um, an increase in CSA signups, so people are joining their local CSA. We're seeing more people buying organic food this spring. Organic food sales are actually up about 20% over the same time last year. And we're also seeing a huge interest in gardening. Um, if you tried to buy seeds this spring, you might have noticed that a lot of seeds were actually sold out all around the US and online as um, a lot of people were interested in starting gardening gardens for the first time. So people are starting gardens for different reasons. They might be trying to avoid a trip to the grocery store. Um, it's a great way to eat organic affordably while we're both in a health pandemic and an economic crisis. But there's so many benefits to growing your own food at home. There's mental and physical health benefits. Um, and you're also cutting your carbon footprint. So the average food you buy in the grocery store travels about 1500 miles to get there. So when you grow your, your own food at home, um, it really can cut down on the fossil fuels and your impact on the climate. So if you're just joining the gardening craze this year or you've been gardening for a while, we're really excited to have Acadia here to answer some of your questions. Um, please drop questions that you have in the Q&A after she tells us a little bit about what we can still grow this summer. Acadia is here to tell us it's not too late to grow food this year. Um, we're also going to take some of your questions. I also wanted to share that Rodale Institute, we've been putting out resources, free resources this spring for people who are gardening, maybe for the first time. You can visit rodaleinstitute.org slash victorygardens. Um, there we have a free Victory Garden starter kit that includes things like organic gardening and composting webinars, handouts, even ways to get your kids involved in gardening. So definitely check out those resources. So let me give you a little bit more background on Arcadia and then I'm going to turn it over to her. Uh, Acadia, before becoming an author, Acadia started a four-season organic market garden in Washington State, inspired by farming pioneers Elliot Coleman and Jean-Martin Fortier. While managing the farm, Acadia drew, grew 200 different food crops, which is a really incredible feat, and um, eventually headed back to school at the University of British Columbia to complete a master's in land and water systems. Acadia now lives in Maine, where you can see her backyard garden. Um, she splits time between Maine and New Hampshire with her farm dog, Nimbus, who I think we'll get a chance to meet today. <laughs> and uh, she actually grows hops to support locally sourced craft beer in New England, um, in addition to raising her own perennials in her backyard. Acadia is the author of several books, including Growing Perennial Foods, A Guide to Raising Resilient Herbs, Fruits, and Vegetables, and Growing Good Food, A Citizen's Guide to Backyard Carbon Farming. Her newest book, Tiny Victory Gardens, Growing Food Without a Yard, um, which is something that might be applicable to a lot of people tuning in today, um, is just the newest addition to the Stone Peer, Peer Press Citizen Gardening series. Um, and I'm really grateful to share that Acadia is actually generously allowing everyone who's visited, viewing this webinar to purchase those books for 20% off. So we're gonna share a code later on of how you can get those books at a discount and we're gonna drop it in the chat as well. Um, so with no further ado, Katie, I wanna hand it over to you and excited to talk about summer gardening, um, hear more about what we can still plant this year and don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A. 
Thanks. Thank you. So we're going to get the PowerPoint loaded here. All right. Thank you guys for joining today. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. I'm really excited to talk to you. So today, as mentioned, we are in my garden on the border of Maine and New Hampshire. Um, and I also wanted to introduce someone behind the scenes, Emily Castle. She's the one doing kind of the tech support, running the slides um, and helping with kind of everything behind the screen. So I'd like you all to welcome Emily Castle um, and let's just get started. So we'll do start the first slide, perfect. So today we're gonna to talk about some regenerative gardening basics, three ways that you can get your plants started today despite the heat and how to establish them with things like mulch and irrigation to get you started right. So, I first started farming right after I graduated college in 2011 during my last semester of school. I had the opportunity with two of my best friends to kind of inherit this derelict nursery and turn it into a market garden. It was a chance we couldn't give up even though we really had no idea what we were doing. So like good college students, we kind of read every book that we could on regenerative farming and agriculture and we just kind of started to do it. So each year, little by little, we chewed off a new piece of the farm, building raised beds, building infield growing spaces, renoing greenhouses, um, until, you know, after a six year period, we kind of had this thriving market garden that was the pillar of our community um, that served CSAs, sold wholesale foods to restaurants. We had a little farm stand that kind of became a gathering area uh, every Saturday for, the, for our community members. So it, it became this really special place. Um, but our location at the northernmost tip of Washington meant that we had some interesting weather challenges to deal with. For starters, we had 15 hours of sunlight during the height of summer. So we would kind of watch the summer sun bake our soil during these prolonged periods of droughts that we just weren't really accustomed to. Um, and then when it did rain, it was, it was absolutely torrential. So the water came down all at once. It pooled on the hard packed surface of the soil and it never really percolated down to the roots where our plants needed it the most. So we started to, to get concerned and the locals noticed too that there were longer stretches without rain and rainier times when it finally did come. So I decided to go back to school to kind of answer some of these questions I had about how to improve my own farm um, because we were, we were starting to get a little nervous, but we did not want to give up. Um, so as mentioned, I went back to school for the university, at the University of British Columbia to study soil and water management. And it was there uh, that, I, that I did find some of the answers that I was looking for. And from that point on, it was kind of um, eye-opening. Eye I started to realize that I didn't need to focus as much on growing healthy produce. And if I, had fo if I focused more on cultivating rich, healthy soil, the soil would do the hard lifting for me. So next slide, Emily. So when I returned to the farm with my new degree, I spent the first day walking around the grounds of my little small plot, just really focused on, on seeing what, what is the state of my soil and, and how can I make it better. So I just went right to work. I began treating every square inch of my farm with lots and lots of compost. I put it where the potatoes grew, under every leaf of lettuce, around the peas, um, and then I covered up that compost with mulch to kind of keep it in place and to help the soil stay uh, moist for longer. I used my favorite type of mulch, which is my go-to combo of um, shredded leaves and grass because it's a really good carbon to nitrogen ratio that really nourish nourishes the soil. And we can talk more about that later. Um, but most importantly, the most important thing that I did on this little farm after school was I stopped tilling the land um, and I just left, let the soil be. And I kind of watched within a year, my soil had done this major transformation. It went from this hard packed, dry soil that didn't absorb the water to this kind of darker, richer, loamier soil. And after two years, I could just put my hand into our soil take a and it would just stay in this satisfying clump rather than just like crumbling between my fingers so I was really impressed at how quickly just a few actions 
could really change how the soil be responded um, and how my plants responded. I know it sounds a little bit corny, but uh, as soon as I started doing this, I swear that our produce tasted better as well. So it was, it was really miraculous. Uh, you know, the community members noticed and then everybody started to just kind of get interested and, you know, ask all sorts of questions because they wanted to take that same, um, same things that were happening on the farm to their own backyards too. Uh, so pretty soon I considered myself a regenerative farmer, which wasn't necessarily something that I realized I was until this whole process took place. Um, so through my studies, I learned that treating the soil right truly made growing food easier. Um, and now I was on a mission, you know, because in school I also learned that soil also does an amazing job at storing carbon. So it's one of these little things that we can all do as a community to kind of help fight climate change. So armed with all of this new information and excitement, um, I, I really sought out to not only make my farm just a little bit better, but also try to do something to help the world a little bit better as well. Next slide. So this is my favorite part, and this is, <laughs> this is the science behind how soil can store carbon. So the whole idea of regenerative practices uh, expands upon the soil's natural ability to store carbon. Already our natural landscapes store about 29% of the total carbon um, dioxide in the world. So the, the trick about um, sequestering carbon underground is keeping it there because it's already doing this naturally. But farm soils across the world have lost between 50 to 70% of their natural carbon stocks. And that happens through the mismanagement of soil, like I mentioned before, tilling, uh, the use of chemicals, stripping the land of forests, all of these things make soil, which naturally holds carbon, into something that actually releases carbon. Um, so it's, it's quite dire. Um, so regenerative practices grow food in a way that aim to keep this carbon and bring this carbon and store it underground uh, permanently. And like I said, it's called sequestration. Uh, and it all starts with photosynthesis. So plants naturally pull carbon dioxide out of the air to produce their carbon-rich sugars. Now these sugars are used to grow leaves, branches, stems. Um, it makes the plants grow bigger, stronger. It's their energy source. So that carbon gets incorporated into their leaves and branches, which fall. And little critters help decompose those fallen leaves and branches into the ground, putting some of that carbon there during that process but the real carbon sequestration happens deep at the roots. So plants have developed this kind of symbiotic relationship with the soil microorganisms beneath their feet, and they release some of these sugars through the tips of their roots um, to entice these good bugs to hang out. And these bugs eat this sugar, and that, you know, that mole those molecules of carbon that were once pulled from the air are now a part of these bugs' bodies. And when they die, that carbon is locked underground unless it's disturbed. So it's, it's, it's pretty, this, like I said, this is my favorite part, being the soil geek that I am. Um, and I'm happy to ask any more questions about it later on in, in the webinar. So some experts do say this is a really interesting fact that I found um, that if adopted broadly, uh, regenerative farming across all the global croplands could sequester as much as the entire transportation sector emits, which is a pretty powerful, you know, action of if we all kind of banded together, we could, we could produce some real change. Next slide, please, Emily. So a lot of this power of good soil, um, nutrient cycling, carbon sequestration, is made possible by all of these little soil organisms, critters, earthworms that live underneath our feet. So I really like to nurture these guys and I really like to make sure that they're active and happy in my garden. Um, so let's take earthworms for example. Through their actions they tunnel through the ground, they eat some of this organic debris, turning it into nutrients, aerating the soil naturally so plant roots can kind of stretch out and grow unencumbered. 
And every spring, I really like to see, you know, how many of these wiggly guys are around. So I like to dig a foot, foot deep by foot wide kind of hole in one of my garden beds, scooping the soil carefully onto a tarp, cardboard, you know, whatever I have around. And I like to count how many I have. And if I see 10, I know that my soil is really healthy and it's a good indicator of other soil organisms that are around. There's also large soil, uh, large, not soil organisms, large things like rodents and uh, moles, things that burrow, dig underground, woodchucks, and they, they open up deep caverns in the soil where water can truly kind of sink deep where it would take a long time to get through. So through these two activities, the earthworms moving along and the moles digging their burrows, that's the natural aeration. And that's what tilling tries to achieve when you break up the soil with a machine. Um, but it does happen naturally if you just kind of let everything alone. And then I think some of my favorite uh, soil organisms live at the rhizophere, which is the, the area around the roots. And these are the same organisms that plants entice to live close to them through the sugars that they release through their roots. And these, these mites, nematodes, mycelium, and microbes, they, they are amazing at cycling nutrients, so making the soil more fertile, but they also are great at defending pests and disease, which is, really, which is still being studied a lot right now. They can even enact a plant's natural defenses to defend diseases on their own. So all in all, they just make the soil and the plants a lot happier and healthier. Next slide, please. So this, this is my second favorite thing to talk about. Uh, once you get to know me better, uh, you'll know that I love to talk about organic matter as well. It's kind of the catch-all um, answer to questions when people say, you know, how do I improve my soil? You add organic matter. How do I make my clay soil uh, more arable? You add organic matter. It's kind of that easy go-to answer that, that's always right. Uh, but organic matter is just uh, kind of a fancy word for anything that was once living, whether it be the kitchen scraps you put into your compost heap or um, the leaves you use as mulch, the grass clippings you take from your lawn, all of that is organic matter and placed on top of the soil. As long as you have some of these soil organisms we've been talking about, they, they break it down into um, either nutrients or this thing called hum humus not hummus like the Mediterranean dish, humus, which is actually a really stable form of carbon as well. So that, that's another aspect of the carbon building um, chain that soil can deliver in soil organisms. So the reason I like organic matter so much is because it not only feeds these soil organisms, but it, it, the way it's designed, its molecular structure has a, has a charge. So it's sort of like that static cling like when a sock is stuck to a shirt when you take it out of the dryer. So it, it behaves like that, but it clings on to nutrients and water. So adding, um, so adding just you know, like 1% increase in your organic matter for your soil over time can increase its water holding capacity by 20,000 gallons. So you don't have to do much to make a really big difference when putting organic matter into the soil. Next slide, please. we have the next slide, Miss Emily? <laughs> We're having some technical difficulties. Please stand by. <laughs> I can talk more about some of these photos you're looking at on the slideshow. Um, oh, there we go. We can talk about those in the Q&A. <laughs> so there are two types of crops that you can grow any time of the year, including the summer. The first is perennials, which is what I like to mostly plant because of their ability to make a really safe and happy environment for these soil organisms. Their roots stay in the ground over the winter, which kind of gives them a, gives soil organisms a safe haven and a place to stick around um, and harbor down during the cold. In comparison to annuals that are ripped out of the ground, thrown into the compost heap, um, leaving the ground bare and unprotected. So I like to kind of stuff perennials in everywhere that I can, whether it be the raspberry hedge that I used at the farm to keep the deer away, or blueberries that I have here, here tucked right next to my deck where nothing else will really fit, 
I've even planted strawberries in um, breeze blocks next to my greenhouse. Just kind of any space available is a great space to put perennials. Unlike annuals where you kind of want them, you know, to be in their ideal conditions because they have such a short season to, to grow and prosper. Next slide, please. So as we uh, start talking about what we can plant now, um, the first thing I'll say is no matter what you plant, always go for variety. The natural ecosystem is kind of a mosaic of different plants, different soil types, and your garden should really be no other, um, it should be no different at all. So, you know, I always go for, you know, a mixture of perennials and annuals um, to really help your garden kind of be a, a self-sufficient ecosystem in its own right. Um, this may sound obvious, but uh, I always tell people the number one thing is to choose plants that you love to eat because what's really the point of putting in some of this effort if you, can, <laughs> if you don't want to eat what you're growing. Um, and it also makes weeding a lot more manageable and enjoyable when you know at the end of it that you can have a fresh tomato to eat for dinner. Um, the final thing, piece of advice I always tell people is to make sure you match your plants with your location. Um, this means putting shade loving plants in the shade, sun loving plants in the direct sunlight, choosing plants that can tolerate acidic soil for those with the low pH. Um, and when we talk about the things that we can plant right now, you can plant any perennial, any, you know, any perennial at all right now, as long as you kind of protect it from the heat and the shock, which we'll go into a little bit more depth coming up. Um, but in terms of annuals, you can plant your heat loving annuals like cucumbers, squash, um, there's certain types of spinach, one's called Malibor spinach that you can grow to beat the heat. There's heat tolerant lettuces, peppers, tomatoes. Um, there's really, there, you're really not limited if you, in case you missed the starting point this spring, you'll still have a very, very fruitful harvest if you start right now. So without uh, much more, we're gonna kinda head into the garden right now where I can show you some tips and tricks uh, that I've kind of come to use to kind of beat this summer heat. Can you guys hear it all right? Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. 
beads rather than the normal technique where I use my two fingers to zipper up the furrow. I just sprinkle a little bit of soil on top, just enough to cover it. I put away my two beads. And the reason I made this furrow, furrow a little bit deeper and wider is because I like to use a pre-soaked burlap. And this kind of acts as another type of mulch, but it has enough moisture that it helps the seeds germinate. So normally I would water the soil first, and then I would apply my wet burlap on top. Then I would just make sure this is moist. I can add another layer of dry burlap to protect this from the sun so it stays wet a little longer. And what this does is it just creates this wet barrier constantly in contact with the soil surface. The one thing you need to be careful of though is you need to check your sprout for your seeds daily because once they start to sprout, this burlap will impede them from going. So the, the reason for this slightly deeper furrow is for when the seeds do start to sprout, they have a little bit of room before hitting the burlap. So the second way to add veggies to your summer garden is through transplants or already grown plants. This is my preferred way because they already have an established root system that makes it really easy to uptake water as soon as they're planted in the ground versus seeds that need to water not only to germinate but also to grow their shallow young roots. So today here I'm going to be transplanting this healthy tomato plant uh, into my tomato row. So the tomato plant that was here before got eaten by a wireworm so I want to fill up my row by transplanting this new crop in. So for starters, as I dig my hole, you usually want it to be about twice as big as your pot. I've also pre-watered this space and that just kind of helps to go uh, reduce chance planting shock. So what I do is I kind of break up the roots by rolling it. I take my two hands and I put it on the surface of the soil and lightly dump upside down over the hole. That's just to protect the stem. So I place my plant in, making sure all the roots are pointing down, and I gently cover the soil around it. So the third way to introduce new crops into your garden in the summertime is through root cuttings. So what I have here is my mint. And I plant it in a pot so it's easy to yank out of the ground. And mint, if given the chance, will easily spread throughout your whole garden if you don't contain it. So this is my quick little solution to do that. So I took my mint here over to the propagation table so that I can start to pull out some roots for planting. So what I do is I just gently put my hand into the roots and I gently loosen the plant, freeing some of the roots. And as you can see, you want these nice kind of thicker roots. These are what's gonna take hold. So I just take my sharp pair of shears, snip off a little section, and you'll notice that it has these little nodes or bumps, and that's where a new plant's going to regrow from. So I like to plant them in four-inch pots because this isn't going right into my garden. In fact, I'm going to take this inside so that I can enjoy fresh mint all year long. So you just gently plant, cover with soil, and keep well watered. So the most important part of growing a summer garden is to retain the moisture in the soil. And how I do this is by two things. The first thing is using tons of mulch, and the second thing is using a drip irrigation system. So as you can see here, I use a lot of straw on my beds. So you see when you dig down, so that lots of, lots of moisture. I also mulch my paths with wood chips, and these break down slowly so you don't have to replace them as much. You also see that below this mulch, I have a very irrigation line. And each, every six inches, there's these little tiny emitter holes. And what that does is it slowly releases water into the soil so it's easy for it to absorb. I also cover the irrigation lines up with mulch so that the water that stays stagnant in those lines isn't scorching hot by the time it gets to the plant roots. The other way that I help with the lack of moisture in the hot summer heat is to plant large annuals like corn as a windrow. So what that does is it prevents the wind from going across my plants, um, desiccating them or 
allowing the water to evaporate more quickly. I hope you enjoyed some of the tips and tricks I had for you today. I'm sure you have a lot more questions, which I'm happy to answer right after I pick some more vegetables. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Acadia, for sharing all those tips from your beautiful summer garden. <laughs> uh, we have a couple questions from everyone who's been watching. So, um, and please continue to drop questions. Um, I just wanted to start off by asking about your, your new book, Tiny Victory Gardens. Can you explain what the Victory Garden movement is for people who maybe aren't familiar with that term? and talk about why it's having a resurgence nearly 80 years later? Sure, so the, the concept of a victory garden kind of started in World War, II, World War I, but really gained traction during World War II, and it was a way for the people that were stuck left at home to participate in the war effort. So there was, you know, people were put under rations, so there was less food to be had, and the transportation usually used to transport food around the country was now used to transport troops and weapons. So the government actually encouraged, uh, you know, people at home to start growing their own food. And it, you know, there was posters hung up, um, you know, fighting for food. And it was kind of this really momentous kind of groundswell of community action um, that by, you know, middle of the war, you know, millions of gardens sprung up. Um, and it was it was quite remarkable. So it, I think this idea is having a resurgence today uh, Just because of everything that's going on. So people want to be more self-sufficient They want to have control over the food that is available to them and you know in light of COVID-19 It's kind of poking a lot of holes into how just how delicate our own food system is at the moment so I think people are turning to gardening as a way to kind of do something positive in this really tumultuous time. Um, the other aspect about it, which I've kind of started uh, talking about is the idea of a climate victory garden. So kind of harnessing this groundswell and this momentum that people have towards, towards gardening right now and, and using it to explain these kind of carbon sucking benefits that gardens can have with the idea that if we all kind of treat our own little patch of soil just a little bit better, it will be doing just one more thing, positive thing for the environment um, that, you know, as a group, as a collective action can really do, you know, global good. Um, so my newest book is called Tiny Victory Gardens because uh, through writing these two books and talking with people, I've realized that uh, not everybody has the space for a traditional garden. So, you know, a lot of people and, you know, people that have logged on to hear me today are container gardening. So I wanted to dedicate an entire book to kind of the best practices and regenerative ways in which you can, you know, garden in really small, tight spaces. That's awesome. Yeah, it's amazing to think at the height of the Victory Garden movement, Americans were growing 40% of their 40 own. 40%, yep. Yeah. So it's, it's great to see an interest in gardening again. I'm gonna take a few questions from our viewers. Uh, we have a question from Erica, who is listening from New Hampshire. Uh, we know that pollinators are really important for crops. So what do you do to attract pollinators to your garden? So I do a few things. The first thing is I avoid using chemicals um, at all costs. I do have some organic tricks that I use. Um, but they're all pollinator safe because, you know, there's no, there's no benefit in destroying all of the bugs in your garden. You want this balance of good bugs and bad bugs. Uh, I also plant flowering perennials that I know pollinators like bees and wasps will like. So there's sage, you know, there's kind of this, I w as I was speaking before about the kind of the mosaic, you know, patchwork of your garden. You want to provide enough habitat and food that actually makes them want to stay. Um, and I'm also fortunate enough to have um, a beehive. So, you know, if I can't attract them, then, um, you know, you bring them to your, to your garden. And they, they're very active. They buzz around. Um, and last year, with their, you know, productiveness, we got seven pounds of honey out of the hive. That's great. So uh, another one of our viewers um, is 
writing in from near Allentown and oh wait I'm, I'm lo looking for this question <laughs> okay I lost that question so I'm gonna try another one um, <laughs> One of, the, one of the challenges that we have in summer is we know that um, crops that typically like the cooler weather, like lettuce, um, can bolt in the heat. Yep. So Julie wants to know if you found any varieties of lettuce or spinach that um, have done well in the, in the summer weather. Yeah, so spinach is a lot tougher, so I'll start with lettuce, and there are a large range of heat-resistant um, varieties of lettuce, and depending on who your local seed company is, they might have their own that they've adapted for your area. So that's one reason why it's always a great idea to buy from your local seed company, because they usually have trial farms in your area, and they get to experiment with what works well in your exact location. Because as you know, you know, what I'm growing here in my southern main garden is going to be very different than what someone's growing in Florida. Um, the, other, the other thing um, that you can do or growing these crops that really like it a bit cooler is to also put a shade cloth over them. So it can be a really, you know, makeshift apparatus. You know, sometimes in the garden I like to use just bamboo poles with a bit of burlap uh, put over the top for the really hot, hot, hot spells during the middle of the day. There's also some other varieties of spinach-like plants. So it's not a true spinach, but there's one called Malabar spinach. And it's, it tastes like spinach, but it loves and thrives in the heat. So kind of branching out of the normal foods and seeds that you usually eat and trying some of these experimental crops is just a really fun way to get more involved in gardening um, and kind of learn these new things. Okay, I found the last question. This was Sandra. <laughs> um, she says her yard is kind of hilly. As, as we know, not everyone has a perfectly flat space. Yep. Is there anything that you recommend growing on a, a hilly yard? Sure. I mean, if you, if you plant right, you can grow almost anything on a hilly yard. If it's very steep, you know, one thing that you can try is to grow vining crops that aren't going to be top heavy. So what would make me nervous if you're on a steeper hill, if you have a tall tomato plant, it could topple over. So if you try low growing things like bush beans, cucumbers, zucchinis, watermelons, honeydews, stuff that naturally likes to spread on the ground, I think that'd be a good place to start. What, one of our attendees wants to know what other plants you can grow from root snipping besides mint. So you can grow a lot of herbs um, and some fruits like raspberries, another really good candidate for root snipping. Um, there's also, you can also take clippings from the, the mature plants themselves, which I didn't go into in the video, but you can take what's called a softwood clipping. So it's kind of that bendy part of new growth rather than the hard, rigid, woody growth. So you can take this, you can snip off the flexible growth and you want to strip off some of the lower leaves, leaving at least, you know, a few on for photosynthesis. And then you can pot those in your four-inch pots as well. Uh, depending on what you're experimenting with, you might need the aid of what's called a rooting hormone. And what that does is it tricks the plant um, to produce roots. Uh, a lot of herbs also can freely root if you make a mature, you know, it's called a sprig or a cutting, and you place it in water for a few weeks, changing it, um, you know, every other day or so. And in about three weeks time, you'll start to see the, the you know, angel hair like roots forming. And once you see enough of those roots form, you can then go ahead and plant it into soil. A follow up question to that, Kristen is wondering how long do cuttings usually take to become a mature plant? So the reason I like cuttings is because some of the things we're talking about, you know, perennial bushes, herbs, they just take such a long time to grow from seed. Um, you know, it can take up to a month for some of these seeds to even germinate. So before you can even see them poking through the soil, you've already, you know, waited four weeks. So every plant's a little different in terms of you know how quickly a cutting will grow to maturity but it is it is a huge uh, leap forward rather than growing from seed. So one of our viewers is Andrea she's tuning in from the central coast in California. She has a question about container media. 
what do you find is the best mixture of material for in-home garden? Oh, that's a good question. So, you know, one of the considerations when you're bringing plants inside or growing things inside is you do want a relatively clean, you know, potting soil because you don't want to be kind of bringing in mold or bugs into your home environment. So there's tons and tons of um, potting soils to choose from at your local nursery um, or supply store. What I always look for, you know, there's not much of a difference between inside versus outside container growing in terms of what you're looking for. But one of the things that I always um, remind people is that, you know, it is in your, in, it's in your home, you're breathing, you're living around it. So organic is always the best option. I always look for potting soils that have a label called OMRI. And that's um, this independent institute that kind of looks at whether or not things are made organically or not and gives it their big stamp of approval. So always look for potting soil with those things. And then the other thing when considering which potting soil to buy is, um, you know, looking at the ingredients. So I always kind of shy away from potting soils that are made with a lot of peat just because peat is, is very hard to source sustainably. So what happens is companies come in and they scrape off that top layer of a peat bog um, and it takes a decade or more for that bog to kind of rehabilitate after it's been mined for peat. So I always look for alternatives. Um, one of my favorite is called coconut core and it's a byproduct of the coconut industry. So um, it works just the same as peat, as you know, it keeps things fluffy, it keeps uh, holding the moisture in. So if you can find a potting soil that is both organic and made predominantly from coconut core, you're off to a really good start. That's great. So one of our viewers, Anne, she's asking about companion planting. Can you give any tips or advice for people who are thinking about companion planting in their garden? Yeah, I love companion planting because um, for one, it helps really maximize space. So you can put all sorts of plants next to each other. You know, you don't have to think of gardening as this traditional one row of this followed by another row of that. You can mix all of your plants together. Um, and in fact, it, it helps, you know, curb disease because you know, uh, you know, one plant might get some powdery mildew on it, but the other plants are, are saved. Uh, it also introduces more pollinator to the garden. Um, you really can't go wrong. And most fruits, herbs, and vegetables don't really have that many enemies. Uh, one of the exceptions that I don't tend to interplant is fennel because it, it has a very strong smell and it can even um, release some of these chemicals from our, its roots that inhibit the growth of the plants around it. So fennel's kind of left into the corner of the garden um, while everybody else gets kind of intermingle. Um, and herbs are another great thing for companion planting too. I put them at the end of my vegetable rows. I put them around the edge of my fence in my garden because their strong smell helps to deter, you know, small pests and large pests alike. So we're getting quite a few questions about summer squash. So people have squash on the mind. Um, <laughs> What are your thoughts on pruning squash and how do you deal with powdery mildew? Any organic solutions for powdery mildew on squash? Yeah, powdery mildew on squash is, is a big one. Um, my squash gets hit pretty much every year. I just try to harvest enough from it before that happens. There is an organic, the, the thing with molds and mildews is most of the organic treatments and even non-organic treatments are preventative. So they won't actually cure the powdery mildew, but if you use it um, once the environmental conditions for powdery mildew start to occur, you can slow down its process and its hold on a plant. So if you are worried about powdery mildew, what you wanna look for is really warm, hot, humid days and cooler nights. So that's why you tend to see a, a bigger burst of powdery mildew end of the summer heading into fall when your nights really start to cool down. Um, the other question you had was about pruning squash. I don't typically prune squash, uh, although I'm very tempted to sometimes when it starts running all over the garden. Um, but if you notice squash, you know, squash vines are quite hollow and watery. 
So every time you cut into one, you're inviting a very large, um, you're creating a very large wound that just kind of can invite pests and disease into. Not to say you can never do it, it's just, uh, it's something to really think about before you do. And if you're pruning it to try to maintain it in a small space, I would recommend looking for varieties of compact bush-like summer squashes because they grow in a much more upright, contained pattern and don't just vine wherever they want to go. So one of our challenges in organic gardening, of course, is always dealing with pests. Um, some of our viewers are wondering what you do for organic pest control. Um, Julie in particular is asking about any suggestions for vine borers. Ooh, vine borers is a very, very tough pest to beat because there is a very small window of treatment. So um, a lot of vine borers come from moths and they lay their eggs on the underside of leaves. Those eggs hatch into little baby caterpillars, which then kind of feed on the leaf until they grow big enough to actually bore in to the vine of, or the thicker stem of that crop. So your treatment window for catching these guys is that small window of time when they're too small to bore in, you know, freshly hatched, but still too small to bore into the stock. So um, commercial farmers, uh, myself included, we rely on these fancy calculations called the grade A models, which kind of estimates at which point that perfect window is before we apply our organic treatments. Um, it's a little bit extreme for the home gardener. Um, so I always recommend, you know, if you start to see, you know, acquaint yourself with what these moths look like. Um, and when you start to see them flying around the garden, you know that you should probably start to be applying a weekly spray, you know, to, to catch those caterpillars right as they hatch. So something that works really well on caterpillars is called VT, and it's actually a natural um, soil bacteria that, you know, interrupts the, the pest's digestive system and they kind of, once they eat the leaves where the BT is on, uh, it's kind of a slow, sad death, uh, which many organic controls are, um, but that, that will do the trick right away. So, uh, Laura is asking if you have a list of what some of your favorite Victory Garden vegetables are. I can't live without tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's definitely in every garden that I grow. I also uh, can't live without lettuce. Sometimes I even eat it for breakfast. So and that's one of my, you know, all-time favorites, half the plant. It's also pretty compact. So no matter what size space you have, you can always kind of have a, have a salad ready. You can even grow it indoors, which makes it um, even better. I also can't live without my favorite lemon cucumbers, which are these little... Um, like baseball sized cucumbers that are so they're round not long and green um and they just they're just fantastic so i think one of the benefits of growing a victory garden no matter what size is that you get to try these interesting varieties of fruits and vegetables that you would just never find in a supermarket um you know there's all sorts of different shapes and sizes and colors and flavors of all of your favorite vegetables that you've just never been able to try before so just going to ask the last couple questions here as we come to the end of our time. Um, in your presentation, you talked so much about biology and chemistry. and It's just really fascinating to hear all the things that you know about science. Um, I'm curious, do you recommend for other home gardeners to do soil testing? And what should they do with those test results? Sure. So I, I do think soil testing is really important. I always tell people, you know, if for whatever reason that that puts you off, you know, don't let that stop you from starting a garden. Um, but I rely on soil tests to see if my regenerative approaches are actually working. Am I actually um, improving the nutrients and fertility of my soil? Am I increasing the organic matter for content of my soil and by how much? So all of that information I wouldn't be privy to unless I tested my soil. Um, the other really important thing about uh, getting a soil test at least once uh, is you may not know what your land was used previously for. Um, so there's always the issue of um, contamination. Uh, lead is 
one of the biggest ones. Um, I, ha I tell this story all the time. Uh, one of during one of my book talks, I had you know I did my little spiel on soil tests, and I had one of the women raise her hands after I was done, and she said, "I I have to share this story." Uh, to let every, all of you know how important it is. And she goes on to tell the story how she ripped out all of her front yard and completely planted it with all edible crops. Um, and for whatever reason, the last stage, they took a soil sample and her, you know, she lived in a suburban area, you know, nothing indicated that things would be contaminated, but the levels came back through the roof. Um, so they had to rip down all of the plants and landscaping they did dig out all the soil and kind of start from scratch. So, you know, I, it's definitely worth doing at least once. And then a lot of times when you get your soil test back, you know, the, the it comes with recommendations. So it's not like you have to uh, decipher the nutrient levels and say, oh, I need three more pounds of nitrogen. They usually give you those um, suggestions that come with the test as well. And if they don't, I will encourage everybody to reach out to their local uh, extension office. Uh, just a quick phone call. They're always happy to chat with you about your specifics um, related to soil tests, even any other crop issues that you're having. Uh, they're kind of this uh, national resource that we all have at our disposal that we should all use more regularly. So a lot of families might be spending more time at home this year with kids home from school and activities being canceled. Uh, do you have any tips for how we can get ch uh, our children involved in gardening? I mean, in my experience, I haven't had to try very hard at all to get kids really excited about gardening. Uh, one of my favorite experiments that I like to do uh, with a group of children is to grow a bean because it's a really big seed. They can all see it. Um, if you grow it in a glass jar, you can start to see the roots form and swirl around it. Uh, so I always like to prep them going into the outdoor gardens early um, by having them do that experiment. They can take it home. They can watch it grow. It teaches them a little bit of responsibility that they have to water it and nurture it. Um, and from my experience, you know, kids are just so excited. So by the time they do get in the garden, they already have a little bit of respect for the plants. They know they're a little bit fragile. They know they need to be cared for. Um, and they just really love getting their hands dirty, especially if I have them out there look, helping me look for earthworms by digging my pit. Um, all of that good stuff. So with our last couple minutes, I'm just wondering if you have any final advice, maybe in particular for first time gardeners knowing that we have a lot of beginners joining our movement this spring. Uh, what advice do you have any for first-time gardeners? I always tell first-time gardeners to start small. Um, it can be really easy to get excited and carried away, especially if you were looking at this beautiful high gloss seed catalog. Um, so just start small. Pick, pick three things that you want to try growing, whether it be in the ground or in a container, and just try those three things um, to kind of build up your self-esteem, build up, you know, your, your knowledge base and your, you know, confidence, I guess. Um, and then once you've kind of mastered those three things, you can add on some more crops later on. If you're looking for the easiest crops to start with, I always tell people um, your leafy greens, your spinach, lettuce, kale, chard, those types of things, as well as your herbs. Uh, because herbs actually kind of thrive in a not so great environment to begin with. So you don't have to spend a lot of time prepping your soil um, and making a really fertile garden bed because they honestly don't really like it anyway. So <laughs> they're a great place to start just because they're pretty foolproof. Um, they like, you know, they can handle dry conditions and poor soil environment and, and they grow wonderfully inside as well. So it's definitely a good place to start. Well, with the last couple minutes before we wrap, I just wanted to thank you, Acadia, for coming on today, talking about starting a summer garden. I want to thank you for being a Rhode Island Institute ambassador and helping us bring our message about healthy soil and healthy food and regenerative farming um, to more people. I want to remind everyone who's tuned in that we have a bunch of free resources for gardening at rodaleinstitute.org slash victorygardens. 
And Katie, I'd love to turn it over to you to let people know how they can get this book, uh, your new book and any of your other books and some ways to follow you and stay in touch. Sure. So you guys can get my books at stonepierpress.org slash store. And if you use the code Rodale, all caps, 20, you can receive 20% off uh, my first two gardening books, which mentioned were Growing Perennial Foods and Growing Good Foods. You can also stay in touch by following Stone Pier Press um, on Instagram or Acadia.tucker on Instagram as well. That's great. And I definitely highly recommend Acadia's books. Uh, a lot of the things we talk about at Rodale Institute um, with composting and cover cropping and no-till, um, Acadia makes it really practical and realistic for backyard growers. So um, it's a great, these are great resources for um, becoming more resilient and growing your own food and supporting your community and your own health. So really appreciate having you on Acadia. And um, I, we did have someone who asked how long the, they can use this code for. Um, will this be up for a couple, at least a couple weeks? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I'll have to, I'll have to. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if we have a definitive end date, but um, yeah. <laughs> I think it will be good for some time here. So, um, but don't delay. If you want to get the books, go on and order them right away. And thank you so much again, Acadia. Please follow Acadia and good luck to all of the people who are starting to grow their own food. Um, we really, we welcome you in our movement. And we, we're actually been using a hashtag all spring. You're welcome to use hashtag V for Victory Gardens. If you wanna share your gardening you're doing at home with us at Rodale Institute, we'd love to see it and um, use that hashtag. So thank you again and thank you for joining us. Thank you, bye everybody.